Hey everybody, welcome to day 28, part three. I'm here with Jordan, and uh, he's enjoying the coffee that I made yesterday. It's coffee. Also choking on it, yes. <laughs> Too much ginger in there. All right, um, so we're gonna play for you six clips. They're each very short, anywhere from about 45 seconds to a maximum of two minutes. What we're gonna be playing is a MIT PhD. He has actually multiple multiple degrees but is a PhD in biochem engineering. So George, just for the sake of reference, you have a degree in biochem. What do you yeah. think it would be like to get a PhD in biochem? What, what type of well, I mean, brain from MIT would, are we working with right here? Specifically, I mean, biochem engineering, I know chemical engineering and biochem engineering are some of the highest paid uh, engineers in the, in the country. I've seen people go through chemical engineering programs and so few people make it through and biochem engineering is probably even harder than that because you have to take into consideration the organism you're working with and everything. So it's, it would be, it would be a nightmare. <laughs> it would be tough. So we're, we're dealing with somebody who's uh, on, on level of brilliance here. We're talking about somebody that's, that's truly brilliant. Yeah, absolutely. Never mind the fact that we're talking about MIT, <clears throat> we're talking about um, biochem engineer from MIT and he apparently has multiple degrees. Now, here's why I bring this up. You're gonna hear six clips. What I want you to pay attention to are not just is not just what he's saying here. I did my best to mitigate the political stuff in here. If you want to hear the full interview, go go for it. What I'm interested in is the science that this PhD biochemical engineer from MIT is bringing. And you're gonna notice that Jordan and I have been saying this for the past four weeks. I want you to hear carefully what's being said, and then we're gonna reference um, a, a couple of things, add to it a little bit. And, uh, and each clip will continue to have dialogue. So let's play the first clip where he's talking about the immune system and the overreaction of the immune system when it comes to COVID-19. Has been in this environment for nearly four decades across multiple presidents, and he's essentially embedded into the scientific establishment, which has created an unfortunate lie about the immune system and an unfortunate lie about the solution to something uh, like this called the coronavirus, or more importantly, infectious disease, without any real emphasis, which is a real issue, about the fact that it is an overactive, dysfunctional, weakened immune system that overreacts, and that's what causes damage to the body. And unfortunately, Fauci has not talked about that because the truth of that leads to a solution which has nothing to do with mandating vaccines and shutting down the country. And that's what's unfortunate. Okay, so that, that's the first clip. Now, mind you that we talked about the fact that the focus of everything has been for four weeks on the immune system. There's no political agenda here. I'm not running for office. I'm not, the, the only, this is totally for free. These videos that are coming out, I have less than a thousand subscribers, so I'm not being paid by YouTube. Everything here has been a public service annou announcement for all of you. And everything up here has been about addressing the immune system in ways that most people are not talking about it. If you can sh show me anybody that has pieced together what we've done over the past four weeks, talking about the digestive system, mitochondrial health, insulin, um, um, the organs, we talked about organ removal, we talked about all the vitamins, the fat soluble vitamins, especially vitamins A, D, blah, 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 on and on and on, including the breath work, the meditation we're doing, the exercise routines we're doing, where we're going into technique, has there been anybody in the past four weeks that has brought you guys more to talk about the immune system than us? Now here's this PhD talking about what we really need to focus on is the immune system and the fact that it's an overreaction of the immune system. I'm gonna ask Jordan, what do, you, what do you think it is about an immune system that makes it overreact and why that's so bad? Like what would intuitively make sense when the meaning if the body's already overrun with all of these things that are problematic from yeah. organs to the, what, what inevitably will happen when the, when the body goes into a, for this has become the popular word, cytokine storm, cytokine storm. I like saying cytokine storm, <laughs> cytokine storm, because it sounds like a superhero, but go ahead. What, what, what is your in interpretation of that? Well, you, do you mean like a how, why does it become that? Yeah, why is it that some people are becoming so over overactive? Yeah, do you think I, it has something I, to do with yeah, the overall? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that I think that when you take into consideration that people, a lot of people have chronic inflammation, um, that's a chronic activation of the immune system. So it's already primed to be overreactive once it's another uh, threat comes in. Um, we talked about gut permeability. Well, let's pause right yeah. there when you talk about um, 
constant. They, they, we've talked about cumulative inflammation. We did a video where we talked about cumulative inflama inflammation. We talked about inflammaging, right? That our, that our main, that one of the main topics right now in terms of aging is, if we want to point to one thing, it's inflammation, right? And it's the chronic inflammation. It's not acute inflammation. If you get a, if I punch Jordan in the arm real hard, his his arm's going to get inflamed, and it should, right? That's how the body heals. But if the body's constantly, chronically inflamed all of the time, what does that generally mean? That there's some underlying yeah. problems, right? Or all of the time. This is inflammaging. Go ahead. What else were you going to say? I was going to say gut permeability because um, if you have lipopolysaccharides or even full bacterial cells leaking out of your gut into your bloodstream, that signals for the immune system to become hyperreactive too. Uh, we talked about this in one of the earlier videos like a few weeks ago about how the body very much does not want things leaking out of your gut because any bacteria in your bloodstream is going to kill you. So the immune system is a very strong response to that. So if that's constantly happening to you and you have this inflammation and you have all these other problems, your immune system is primed to be overreactive to any other threat that comes in. And how about just the body just being malnourished in, ter in terms of fat-soluble vitamins and all the vitamins that we talked about but between the B vitamins and people eating way too much sugar and insulin resistance and organ yeah. uh, organ health. What do yeah. you think of all that as I, well? I think, I mean, <clears throat> vitamins A, D, and C are all important for immune response, mm -hmm. obviously. So, um, I mean, maybe, maybe obviously for us, but not for everyone. Um, so, yeah, if you're deficient in those vitamins and you also have these other issues, that's, that's an extra, another layer of, of uh, problem that you have. How about sleep? How about people being underslept and what we know about the immune system and how people that are underslept are, are three times more likely just to catch the common cold, which I cited in a previous video. Mm -hmm. um, what about things that we talked about up here in terms of people that are already on pharmaceutical medications, right? That could be harmful to their liver, to their um, kidneys and, and things of this nature, people with high blood pressure, people with these core, co uh, comorbidities, which we keep hearing about. Guys, come on now. We've been on this. We talked about all this stuff. We talked about mitochondrial health. We talked about a lot of things here that map onto what is just a 45 second statement by this PhD, which he says an overactive mm -hmm. immune system. The, your question should be, but why are some people so overreactive? We've tried to explain over the past four weeks. Let's hear the next video where the doctor starts, and this is a critical one, doctor starts talking about um, the medical school education. So where are your typical med medical doctors getting their education? It's big pharma, it's big pharma type education. It's funded by big pharma. And I want you to hear wh what has to be the ultimate solution here. It's gonna come in a pill, it's gonna come in a vaccine, it's gonna come in a shot, it's gonna, this is how doctors are trained. Are doctors brilliant? They're brilliant, they're super brilliant. They're unbelievably brilliant but recognize how they're trained to treat disease. Go ahead. Christina, look, if you look, uh, Christina, at the typical MD, many of them go into wanting to become a doctor out of some noble service, but fundamentally the medical school education is really a big pharma a medical education where the doctor is really trained, if this, then this, and the then is typically a pharmaceutical drug or some uh, harsh medical intervention. Now, if you look at someone like a Fauci and Bricks, they're sort of at the top of their quote-unquote game, which means they're highly embedded into the big pharma model of medical education and the big pharma model of what the solution is. And that solution is typically a direct line from this disease, find typically a virus or a bug, and then recommend a vaccine or some harsh chemical solution. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop that there. So it's just important that you recognize that this is the case. I'm, like I said, I'm purposely leaving out things that I'm trying to leave out things that are politically motivated. I'm just trying to give you guys the facts that these are in fact the facts that medical doctors are insanely brilliant, but um, if you don't know this, they are not well trained in um, vitamins, minerals. This is a fact and, and they're not, they're, in fact, Dr. Matthew Walker talks about they get about one hour of education in their medical training in sleep. Guys, this is this, a lot of the stuff that we're talking about. I promise you, your medical doctor, they're not trained the way that you think they're trained. They're trained to write scripts and they're trained to understand disease in a very particular way. Now, Jordan and I didn't rehearse this at all. Do you, do you agree with this? Do you disagree with this? Is this something that you're um, on board with, not on board with? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't 100% know what the curriculum is for medical doctors. I'm sure that there probably are programs that are better at, at giving some of these uh, topics. But, you know, when I was going for my degree, I didn't learn very much about vitamins or minerals or anything like that, which you think would be important in something like a biochem class. So I could see that the fact that doctors might not get as much education in that as they should be getting. I will talk, I will put a link up here from somewhere that, that maybe I'll put a couple links that talk specifically about how little doctors are educated in sleep, how little doctors are educated in nutrition. I'll put it right here. I'll do that homework for you. It is, it is common knowledge, everybody. Um, and I know it may seem disturbing, but it is important to understand the paradigm in which doctors are coming at this disease, which is from, here's the problem, let's find the vaccine. Let's not understand underneath it all how the immune system in the human body, how to bolster it and, and how to make us fundamentally stronger overall. This third video coming up, will talk about death counts and he'll talk about diagnosis codes that are being blurred in, in the hospital. So listen, listen carefully here. Um. And you know what, you just brought up something about the death count and I wanted to touch on that with you. We are hearing reports from doctors who are saying they are being instructed to count deaths as coronavirus deaths, even if the person died from a different condition, but at some point in time had contact with somebody who had coronavirus. Dr. Burks just came out and said they're classifying everybody with the virus as a death instead of die from the di virus as a death. Uh, why do you think that they are classified this way? Why do you think there's an exaggeration in the numbers here, if you think there's an exaggeration in the death count numbers? Look, what I do know is this, that the WHO, in conjunction with the CDC, is the one that decides what are called codes, diagnosis codes. Um, most people don't know, when you go into a doctor's office, a doctor looks at you, and in their you know, IT systems, they have to say, okay, Christina has this or this. That is called the diagnosis code. That code, Christina, comes from the um, uh, WHO. So for coronavirus, as I understand, they created two codes. One code was you explicitly, you know, had a test and you had COVID-19. The other one was completely nebulous. Well, it sort of smells like that. Maybe he's got some chest pain. Something so broad, but it was still under the COVID-19. The doctors in the United States received a letter from the CDC, as I have found out, that went to hospital administrators encouraging them to blur both of those codes. So if someone comes in, they have a pre-existing condition, someone with a chest pain, COVID-19, okay? And in fact, when someone dies, they do the test. Sometimes the test doesn't come back for 14 days. They're still putting COVID-19 on them. So they're increasing the numerator and then as far as the denominator goes, we don't even know how many people actually have been infected because this is, again, a flu-type virus. So the denominator could be massive. Okay. So, so now Jordan's going to pull up the next video. But before we listen to the next video, because you may be saying, why? Why would they be doing this? We're going to play that reason for you right now. But I do want you to know, and I'll put a link up here, where they're talking about numbers that just came out of Germany. If you're unfamiliar, they did a randomized study of 1,000 people in different locations. And this is enough to give a pretty good snapshot of the total population. Out of the thousand people, 2% tested positive for COVID-19. You ready for this? 16% had the antibodies, meaning that they were sick, they had the virus, meaning that they didn't know it, but they had the antibodies. That means that for every positive test, that for every, for every person you test positive, you have eight people who had the antibodies. So when we're talking about numerators and denominators, we gotta start asking ourselves some questions here. And when we look at the numbers coming out of the hospitals and how we know that these numbers are being bolstered, and then we look at who's actually, being, who's actually sick and who's actually susceptible. And when we're talking about the immune system, we'll get to that in a few minutes, but let's ask ourselves, well, why would these numbers be fudged in the hospitals? Here we go. For two reasons, hospital administrators get money for the COVID-19 diagnosis, plus they also get kickbacks for what are called GPOs and PBMs for the ventilators. So there's, there's a total collusion going on, and it's not about at all about people's lives. So those critically ill patients, immediately they put them on ventilators, and as I've shared in one of my videos, the ventilators actually can burst and further damage the lungs because the real issue here is the lungs are being filled with fluid, and the fluid is occurring because of the overreactive immune system, which can really be addressed by IV vitamin C, high dosage. 
And that is not in the discourse. In fact, 80 to 90% of the people going, ventilators are dying. So this is essentially a death sentence that they're putting people on. It's not in the discourse unless, of course, you've been listening to us talking about intravenous vitamin C. It's not in the discourse unless you've been listening to us talk about the immune system. It's not in the discourse unless you listen to us um, over a week ago talking about ventilators and how ventilators aren't meant to breathe for you, right? And, and that teaching the body how it should actually be breathing all of the time is to your benefit and hemoglobin and, and oxygen delivery and all these things. It's not in the discourse unless you make it the discourse. And that's what we've been trying to do is we've been trying to make it the discourse. So how many times in our videos have we been talking about intravenous, intravenous vitamin C, not oral vitamin C? You can take oral vitamin C. We talked about Linus Pauling. We're not telling you to not do it. But again, intravenous vitamin C, why isn't it part of the agenda? Why isn't it being talked about? I have no idea, but we put a lot of links up here in terms of um, its efficacy. But all I can say is, guys, check this out. Let, let me go on a little bit of a tangent for one second. I'll get your feedback on this. Jordan and I almost ordered hydro, hydroxychloroquine how long ago? Maybe three, four weeks ago? Yeah. Okay, Jordan has access to a website, and it's not it's a little hard to get, but we, we know how to get things, okay? Now, we couldn't do that with any other pharmaceutical, right? So if you know what hoops to jump to, through, we could get hydroxychloroquine and a couple other things um, because Jordan has the green biochem and... and and you, how you have to pay and whatnot, it's a little bit shady, but the point is we could have gotten it. We said, hey, let's get it for grandma in case she gets sick, because before anybody was talking about hydroxychloroquine, we looked into how it worked, and it seemed like, hey, you know what? This has a lot of efficacy. We looked into what it was being used for, and it seemed like a great preventative. Now, understand it's not made by a bi any big pharma company, okay? It, hydroxychloroquine is made a lot in India, there's three stocks that I looked into. One of them is Bayer. The other one, uh, the symbol is SNY, and the other one is MYL. Okay, those are the only three companies that I found that made hydroxychloroquine. Now, I predicted that as soon as a big pharma medication would come online that doctors could actually write prescription for, this is what's going to be prescribed, not the hydroxychloroquine, almost regardless of its efficacy. Obviously, it's saving lives right now, and, and that's why it keeps being administered. But if ivermectin works, which is made by Merck, that's going to be, I promise you that that will start being prescribed more. But you know what they did? Instead of just giving the hydroxychloroquine now, Pfizer, z -Pax, baby, z -Pax with the hydroxychloroquine. You can almost predict that somehow big farmers going to get involved in some way that the, that the, Protocol has to also be a, a big pharma drug, and I predict that that will continue to be the case. Well, yeah, when the when the patent expires on a drug and a company wants to still make money off that drug, they make a new drug. <laughs> you see this all the time. You see that this is what happened with the antidepressant Celexa. Celexa is just so. I, I mean, this is a little bit of a complicated issue, but Celexa is essentially the same exact molecule as Lexapro, which are two different drugs, except it's a specific um, a, an antimer of, of the drug, which means that there's right-handed, left-handed molecules. Right. The Lexapro is just one of those types of molecules. There's no, there's no evidence that Celexa being, it's called a racemic mixture of, of both of these handedness mo uh, molecules. There's no evidence that it works better than just Lexapro, but as soon as the patent expired for Celexa, they needed a new drug to sell. Lexapro is different enough because it's a pure enantiomer of, of uh, Celexa, and they marketed that as a new and better drug, but there's no evidence for that. It's just, it's just, a, it's the same efficacy. There you go. So um, this next clip um, we're going to play has a lot in here. Pull it up. This one is going to talk about the effects of social isolation. So think about what are we doing here? We're isolating people. What are the effects of isolating people? Now, if you've been around your family long enough and if you've been indoors long enough, you can feel that you're starting to go crazy a little bit. But furthermore, what are the effects of being out of the sun? He also talks about what? Vitamins A, D, and C. He already talked about C, but he talks about vitamins A and D. How many times have we been pounding vitamins A and D? He also talks about stress. I'm gonna put a link right here where I talk about Cuomo and what he missed when we're talking about the nocebo effect and stress, stress. Guys, I'm gonna play this clip and then we're gonna break it apart for you. What we have is the approach that we should be taking is taking the people who are 
truly immunocompromised, truly have COVID-19, fine, they should be isolated, boosted up with you know, immuno-supporting things like vitamin A, D, and C. Those of us who are well, you know, we should be back to work, we should be running this economy. Okay, if you want to take something to support your immune system, do that, which should be the vitamin A, the D, etc. One of the, the two most disastrous things here are we're socially distancing people and hiding them. Go look at the research, a landmark study. When you isolate people, that is one of worse than uh, the, the detriments from obesity, smoking, and heart disease. Social isolation actually leads to upregulation um, of inflammatory compounds in the body and downregulation of antiviral compounds. So you're basically increasing the person for viral infection by the amount of stress you're causing them from social isolation. And separate from that, we're telling people not to go out in the sun which is vitamin D. Vitamin D is an antimicrobial. Mm -hmm. So this is essentially a recipe for actually hurting people, not really supporting them, but all brought to you under the rubric. And, you know, media says it over and over again, social distancing, social distancing, flatten the curve. And this is sort of the nonsensical mm -hmm. science that Fauci is expounding. And it's what needs to be exposed. And really, what we really need to talk about, if we truly care about public health, is building up people's immune system. But that's not what Fauci and company are concerned about. Their model is big ag, which dirty air, dirty water, dirty food. They want people to consume, not food that's healthy for them. And then the solution is vaccine mandates. Think about what's going to happen a year from now. When you go to get your driver's license, Christina, where's your vaccine card? And Fauci's already talking about that. Mm, yes. You go to a, oh, yes, he is. This is about developing a police state. I hate to use these very yes. harsh terms. But that is what we're talking about, control of the individual. It's, it's, a, it's a very, very dangerous time. But it's also an opportunity for Americans to go back to our roots, which is freedom, which is basically listening to truth and basically starting to, you know, take back what is really ours, which is our truth, freedom, and health. And Fauci's not about that. He serves the masters of Bill Gates, the Chan Zuckerbergs, the Clintons, the CDC, the WHO, and in fact, the Chinese. This is what we're seeing before in front of our eyes is exporting Chinese model of governance, top down, controlling the last oasis of freedom, which is our human body. Now, I purposely left that last part in, you can investigate yourself, but I, what he said at the end there about, you know, this is our human body, right? It's our right to say what goes here. If we start mandating vaccines, okay, that's, that's tantamount to, you know, there's the whole uh, argument of abortion and this and that. Guys, if we start telling people what they can and can't do to their bodies, there there is going to be a fundamental issue in this country that will not ever be, um, uh, it, it will never go away, okay? If we can't see that the underlying issue here has to do with our immune system, well, I will I will say once again, I am not against vaccines. However, if you choose to not vaccinate your child, if you choose to not take a vaccine, after you get all of the education from your doctor and all of the consequences and understand everything that, that's at stake here, that's your right. That's your right. It is not okay to make a choice uninformed. But if we start mandating things like vaccines, it w my question becomes, where do we now draw the line, right? When does the line get drawn about what goes into our body? And um, because those lines get blurred very, very quickly. Before I go on, do you have any reaction to that? Do you agree? Do you disagree? I, I, I know I, it's a touchy subject. This is a, it's also a hard subject to really say what the best thing is, because it's, it's obvious that certain vaccines did obviously help us. And I'm not saying that you disagree with that. Um, it just, it's it's such a hard, because you, I, I don't even want to go into it too much, but there there are things with vaccines where it's like, you're you're not only doing it for you, you know? Like, yeah, like you're doing it for everybody. You're doing it for everybody. So I guess that's kind of the argument that they would make for mandatory vaccines, or at least having your kid vaccinated when they go into a public school maybe. Mm -hmm. But I mean, like you said, where do you draw the line? You could then you could be like, oh well, everybody has to take this pill now because you know th there's just it's it's hard. It's really tough. Yeah, it's hard, yeah. and and we could talk about it in another time. I actually have a lot that I could that I would like to say about this, but I want to get through these other topics, so maybe we'll talk about it in another video. Yeah, yeah. 
But I also want you to recognize, he talked about the sun and he says, getting people outside, vitamin D. It's not just vitamin D guys, it's also nitric oxide. When, when sunlight hits your skin, it's nitric oxide. And we talked about the importance of nitric oxide. I also put, um, and I'll put it again in the description of this video, how nitric oxide therapy has shown um, effectiveness in the treatment of this virus. Guys, we, nitric oxide is super critical to, to human health, all right? And the bottom line is, is that getting outside, getting into the sun and social interaction in, in order to mitigate depression and things of this nature and stress, like I talked about before, stress on top of it all is a huge immune suppressant. So, so what are we doing? At some point, we got to ask ourselves, like, what is the cost of how we're going about this? The last thing I'll, I'll play here um, has to do with the real solution. And I want you to listen here to some of the history that he talks about because it's for real. And I could go on and on and on here about this line of thought, but I want you to hear more carefully the things that we've talked about in previous videos and the real solution that he's talking about. Go ahead and play that. Look, the real solution, Christina, as any solution to any pathogen, we need to understand that the medical establishment, the pharmaceutical medical establishment for hundreds of years has built its entire foundation of always blaming a virus or a germ. Always. So when scurvy came around, remember scurvy when people's teeth would fall out and they had um, bleeding gums? Oh, it must be a virus. Well, it was deficiency in vitamin C 100 years later, when even people on the ground knew it. When pellagra came out, which was in people's skin and everything would get all dry, horribly dry, like eczema, uh, ultimate conditions. Oh, it must be the Italians who are coming over the ship. They're bringing some dirty uh, germs, and we need to quarantine them. Well, it turned out it was a deficiency in niacin, so on. So what we're seeing here is tr the virus hunters and bacterial hunters creating fear. So the real solution says, number one, is to recognize that the immune system is quite strong. We're actually a walking ecosystem of germs, 380 trillion viruses, 60 trillion bacteria among the 6 trillion cells. There's viruses all around us. The reality is a strong immune system always handles this beautifully. It's the weakened immune system. So all those masks and all this stuff, people didn't wear this for humanity, okay? The issue is, how do you beef up the immune system? As I wrote to the president, vitamin D. Vitamin D is an antimicrobial. Why do you think in many of these hot countries we don't hear any about this? Vitamin uh, A, which is all from the rich uh, leafy green, dark green vegetables and fruits. That supports your body to create uh, keratin, cytokeratin through vitamin A, which protects your cells. So these are the two foundation pillars. Yet Fauci and Briggs do not talk anything about that because a V in vitamin is an anathema for their vaccines. And same with the V in vitamin C is an anathema for their ventilators. You see, it's ventilators and vaccines. Yeah. And this is okay. So not, but not, not only have you guys heard all that before, but again, because there's, this is such a short clip, such a short interview, what also he's not talking about here, yes, I, I give him so much credit for talking about vitamins A and D and sunlight and all these things that he's bringing up. But is he talking about the problems with the absorption of vitamin A, vitamin D? I talked uh, specifically about the issues with the black population and their ability to get vitamin D from the sunlight, how they need so much more light. I put links into how much more light they need from lighter skin. I talked about the issues with taking things like vitamin A and vitamin D because they're fat soluble vitam vitamins. And if your stomach acid sucks, if you have digestive issues, if you are overweight, okay, you need more of it. See, these are things that he can't go into because it's, re it's answer the next question. But we've taken the time to explain to you guys that sometimes answers aren't as easy as they sound. You actually need to learn something about the human body here. Anything on that? Uh, there's just one thing he said that I, I think might have a little bit of an extraneous uh, variable. The the vitamin D obviously is not antimicrobial. It is important for your immune system. We do know this and we've been talking about this. But something he said was, why do you think you're not seeing more outbreaks in, hot, in these warmer countries? I think there's a lot of evidence for this too. If you if you draw like a line, like um, you can see that warmer countries, countries that are closer to the equator, have less infections. 
But it's because the virus isn't viable in warmer climates. So if you went outside and you sneeze on something, it would die way faster in a hotter climate than it would in a cooler climate. So I think the transmission of it just isn't as efficient in a warmer climate. I don't think it really has anything to do with more vitamin D. Mm -hmm. it could, I, there's speculation about that, about whether or not the, the humidity and the heat yeah. um, will have an effect on this virus. That remains to be seen. Obviously, everything's real time here. But the bottom line is, is that you do see that there's less transmission in the in the warmer climate. It could have something to do with vitamin D. It could have something to do with the warmer climate. But guess what, guys? You heard both of this here, both of those things here. Because guess what? What else we talked about? And I put links to. We talked about the sauna. sauna yeah. We talked about Kellogg's. And yes, it is the same Kellogg cereal company. Kellogg happened to be a brilliant individual who looked into the effects of hydrotherapy, meaning um, using hot water. Um, to, to kill uh, viruses, to bolster the immune system. It's like an artificial fever. Exactly, yeah. and guess what? I put a MedCram video up, and the, and the person who runs the MedCram video, who is a doctor on the front lines and has a whole bunch of other doctors in his network that report to him and give real-time information, you can hear him criticizing the entire medical community when he references Kellogg's research, and he goes, isn't it amazing how they use this with such incredible effect, and how quickly it goes out of style in the hospitals. What are we doing? I'll tell you what we're doing. It's not big pharma, baby. It's not big pharma. But guys, come on now. If we don't recognize what we can do for ourselves between red light therapy, breathing work, sauna work, I mean, all this stuff that we're talking about, right? Prop, uh, properly supplementing, understanding how important it is to sleep right. Guys, this is the immune system. We're giving it to you real talk now, all right? Hopefully that helped you guys out. Jordan, thank you for coming in. Sorry the video is so long, for, uh, so long, but if you liked it, please thumbs up. Please share. It's important for us to get this information out. And um, we'll see you in the next video.